Welcome to The Trenches. I'm your host, Rob McCallum. This is our ongoing series of interviews with filmmakers from around the world. And today in the hot seat, we've got pretty much an international icon in my eyes, a real class act, a smart lady, and what I would call probably one of the few genuine people currently living in LA and making a living in this crazy, crazy industry. With me on the line is Miss Maria Olson. Maria, are you there? Yes, I am, Rob, and thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. It almost brought a tear to my eye, actually. Well, you, you know, there's there's very few people that I can label as genuine in, in L.A., as I'm sure you've, you've noticed as, as working there. And there's nothing, uh, there's nothing wrong with, uh, you know, the, the way people are in that crazy city and stuff. But I got to say, it's really nice to meet somebody who's, you know, open, honest and direct, knows what they want to do, knows what they can't do and commit to. And right. uh, it, it doesn't get more, you know, on the head than genuine. So it's a real pleasure that you found time to uh, talk to us here on the Wired and Network on uh, the show, The Trenches. So let's get right to the goods. Let's get the bio questions over with. Let's uh, let's cover who you are, what you uh, you know, what you do. You know, if you can kind of you know bundle that up into a nutshell, and how long you've been doing it. Sure. Um, I'm originally from South Africa, and I started acting when I was approximately six years old um, on stage. Um, since I was. I came from a very small town in South Africa called East London, and we didn't have any access to the film industry at all. Um, so I always knew that I would like a career in the arts, in some form of creativity. So I acted, and I danced, and I sang, and I think I did upwards of 60 to 70 different straight plays, musicals, reviews, etc. while I was in South Africa. I came across to Los Angeles in January 2005, did a bit of theater in Los Angeles, went to New York to do some theater off-Broadway, and then from late 2006 onwards, I have concentrated solely on film um, because I figured that um, at the moment, off-Broadway was as high as I was getting on the theater hierarchy, and I should really take some time to concentrate on a film career, which is really what I always wanted when I grew up in South Africa, watching such iconic actresses as Sigourney Weaver and Sissy Spacek and Kathleen Turner on screen. I was like, they can do it, and you know what? I think I can too. So when I came to LA, I was like, fine, you think you can do it? Show me that you can do this. Well, I got to tell you, you want to talk about concentrating on something. Let, let's just recap some of those numbers that you mentioned to, to, to our audience here. 60 to 70 productions in South Africa. Then, yeah. you, then you come over and do Off-Broadway before you even start your film career. Now, folks, uh, we'll post an IMDb link to Maria's page uh, when the interview goes live. But uh, as of right now, we're close to 100 projects just as an actor, let alone the producing stuff that you're taking on. You are one busy lady to, to get that <laughs> much stuff going on. And you got some quality titles here. I mean, it's not yeah. like they're just a bunch of short films in colleges. I mean, which is a lot of way that actors get their experience in the film because it's a bit different than stage, as we all know. But sure. uh, you, you've got some pretty amazing credits. And you know I'm a huge fan of Percy Jackson, which you play one of the more memorable characters in. Yes, I was Mrs. Dodds, uh, or the Fury who disguised herself as Mrs. Dodds, the teacher. Um, that was such an amazing, wonderful opportunity for me. And that came literally about less than two months after I had signed with my agent, Bonnie Howard, in Los Angeles. So everything just fell into place. It just came together, like everyone says. And that was just astounding to me, really. Well, I mean, for those of you that don't know Percy Jackson, it's uh, written by Rick Riordan, and it's kind of like a Harry Potter setup in that you have a teenage kid who inherits uh, kind of demigod powers. He's the son of Poseidon. Long story short, the cool part, I think, is it's directed by Chris Columbus, who, of course, wrote Gremlins, directed the first Harry Potter, produced the second one, and I believe the third one as well. And now, two months into your film career... Boom, you're on this massive multi-million dollar film. You play the character that informs the audience that this world 
is not the world that we're used to, that it's a fantasy world, and you set the stage for there. And if any, if anybody's read the books, you know that this character comes back uh, in some of the other books because that's the nature of the universe. So hopefully we get to see you in the subsequent sequels. I know the second one is coming out in the summer of 2013. I don't know if uh, Mrs. Dodds is in that. Can you Can you let us in on that? Um, yes, I can. And no, she is not in that one. Um, she comes back in book number five. Okay. So, yes, I am holding thumbs that my character, Mrs. Dodds, will be included again in film number five when we get around to doing that one. So either film number five or maybe the, the third film, because they've been compressing the books a little bit, and a trilogy yes. would, would be at least great, if, if not a, a quadrology or a tetralogy, uh, as, they say, <laughs> as they say, for four films. You also got to work on another big, big production, maybe not so much in the spotlight as Mrs. Dodds, but Paranormal Activity 3. Uh, yes. And I think everybody would say that it was leagues above Paranormal Activity 4 that came out in uh, the fall of 2012. This was one that kind of took it back a little bit. We got to see the beginning of maybe what started the whole Paranormal Activity uh, evil, the thing that, right. that started hunting the main characters that we've grown accustomed to. And you were directly related to that evil, so that's cool again. Yes. Um, at the time I was shooting that project, I had no idea that I was working on Paranormal Activity 3. Um, the breakdowns had been released under a fictitious name. So I thought I had booked a role in a film called Sports Camp. Um, no clue as to what it was until about a week later uh, when one of my um, co-actors emailed me and said, Hey, guess what we shot last week? Paranormal Activity 3. And I was like, oh my goodness, that is simply awesome. Yeah, I mean, that's got to be like, I, I don't know what's more exciting when you book a major role like Percy Jackson two months into starting your film career <laughs> or that you find out that you're going to be in a major film release uh, after the fact. I mean, they both got to be really kind of interesting highs. At least you're not, you don't psych yourself out uh, when you find <laughs> out after the fact, I suppose. I, I usually stay away from psyching myself out about anything, actually. Um... I'm always focused on the future, as in, yes, I will do my best at my audition, my shoot, whatever it is that I'm doing today, but I have other projects I'm working on, other things to do tomorrow, and it's never make or break for me on one specific project. I give them all my best, and if you give something your best, you really should not psych yourself out or be nervous about it. That's just my take on it. No, I think, I think that's a healthy choice. I mean, you can't, as much as people always say live in the moment and appreciate what's going on, you got to keep the irons in the fire. You got to keep pushing because even if you were to have like, you know, the main character of a huge series, like look at Charlie Sheen, for example, you know, lead, yeah. a, lead of two and a half men, shit happened. It hit the <laughs> fan, but uh, you know that he, he found another way to rebound that, you know, of course it was very yeah. public and all that happened, but you never know what's going to happen. Nothing is safe. And, uh, I mean, you look at, it like, his co-stars. I mean, they must have been wondering what the heck's going on. You know, thank God, you know, Ashton Kutcher came in to help save that show. But right, you, ju you, yeah. ju you just never know in this industry. Speaking of some of these things that you got going on in the future, uh, a lot of people may not realize, maybe they do realize, you know, you were in Percy Jackson, Paranormal Activity 3. Uh, you don't book a major role every time you go out. And I know because we're Facebook buddies and uh, we're on Twitter and stuff, I, I see that you're going for a lot of auditions out there. Uh, can you talk about the audition stuff? Do you want to talk about some of the stuff you've auditioned for? Um, what do you think? Sure. I, no problem. Um, you know, unless I sign a non-disclosure agreement, um, like I did on certain projects like uh, Paranormal Activity 3, like um, American Horror Story, I can pretty much talk about the things that I do. For instance, I auditioned for a principal role in The Lords of Salem, and I didn't even get a call back but I was lucky enough to get a small uh, featured role on the film, which made me spend four days on this wonderful set run by the amazing Rob Zombie. And I'm so looking forward to seeing that film. It's like stupid because it looks stunning. So, I mean, for our acting audience, and I got to say, I think that I've been recording like nonstop for the last two weeks. You're the first kind of actor that I've had on here. You're also a producer, uh -huh. but we're talking acting right now. Maybe right. just relate to some of our, you know, the new actors that are listening in or the people that are trying to make a go out of it because you have had success with some of these big landings. What kind of ratio is is it like for the auditions to the booking now that you've been doing it for a while? I've heard like you have to audition like 80 times before you get one role. Is there any truth to something like that? Um, perhaps there might be. Um, I have 
I, I have the suspicion that I'm a bit above average, though, um, because um, I am unique. I am not cookie cutter. So the roles that I go out for, um, I have quite a good chance of getting them if I don't mess up very badly. Um, I've heard people say that you get you book one commercial audition out of a uh, commercial or roll out of every 100 commercial auditions. At the moment, I am at about five or six commercials out of about 50 auditions, perhaps. So I'm a little bit ahead of the average there, too. Well, I, I think uh, the 10 percent odd is, is pretty great. Five for 50. I mean, who wouldn't take those odds? I would. I would love to take that in a screenplay kind of setting, where you know, if I write fifty, I can sell <laughs> five. I think that'd be fantastic. So, right, yeah. So, so let's let's talk. Let's let's switch gears a bit. Those are the big things you've done. You've obviously had some great success as an actor, but you're also being smart about it. You know, you probably don't want to act forever or just act forever. You're transitioning into a producing kind of thing. Well, not really transition. You've established yourself. I mean, anybody's just got to look at your credits. You know, I, I see all the stuff that you post on Facebook. You're helping a lot of other filmmakers. Let's take it back to step one. Why don't you tell everybody, you know, kind of how we first met. And I, the reason why I'm asking is because I think it's kind of cool. It, and it can only really happen at this point in, in time. It's kind of like a 20, 21st century kind of thing. Am I correct? And please don't hurt me. <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> to to think that we met at Pitch Fest, right? 2011. Yeah, we met at Pitch Fest yes. 2011 very briefly. Um, yes, yes. But, but, you, but you meet hundreds of writers there, okay? I know, but I remember that. I totally remember that. And I loved the concept for your first film. And not first film, the first film that I got to know about. Um, and I totally kept in touch with you, which is what I do. I keep in touch with people. I don't just let them fall by the wayside. And I was thrilled to hear that you actually produced and made that film. Yeah. And I cannot wait to see it. Yeah, so I pitched you Unearthly a couple months before I was going into production. Of course, you're busy, so you had a chance to read the script. Like, you got back to me a couple days just before I was going to go to camera. The idea of me pitching it at Pitch Fest a few months was before was really to kind of workshop the idea to see if there's anything wrong with it and if anybody wanted to get on board last minute. Uh, and you know what? Just workshopping it, you know, over 30 people or so that day really helped me tweak it for, for yeah. the script and stuff. But like you said, you kept in touch. Uh, a year goes by or I shoot it and, you know, months go on and stuff like that. We're both on Facebook. We see each other's posts. And this is the part I really think that's cool. This is, this is why social media is important. Uh, you start putting posts. It's late at night. You know, we both work in Pacific time. You know, a lot of Facebook goes to sleep from 9 p.m. on because the East Coast shuts down. Right. So all the all the Las Vegas where I am, all the Las Vegas people, all the L.A. kind of nut jobs are still up working <laughs> away. Uh, and it gets delirious, you know, at 2 a.m. Pacific time. And you start posting stuff with your friend Angel. I'm on there and we're going back and forth on something for a while. And we just start developing more of a, you know, a colloquial relationship, more of a little, I guess, you know, friendship, if you want to call right. it. And yeah. that just that just start, kick started communication again. You know, we didn't have to wait for Pitch Fest to come around. You know, we're, we are in separate cities, even though we're in the same time zone, you know, a four yeah. hour drive away. But it just yeah. it just started things up again. And, you know, I brought up my film again. I think I showed you a rough cut of the trailer mm -hmm. and then enter Pitch Fest 2012 where I just pop by your table again. And for people that don't know about Pitch Fest, and I want, I'm going to talk to you about uh, Pitch Fest specifically later from a producer standpoint, Pitch Fest is essentially an event, and there's a few different ones of them out there, where as a writer, you basically sign up and you meet with producers all day. You have like a five-minute window. Some of them give you 10 minutes, and you'll pitch your idea nonstop, hoping to get some traction, hoping to develop, make some contacts, and uh, take it forward. So Pitch Fest 2012 comes along. We had met the year before, talked on Facebook in between, and now here we are, 2012, and I'm talking to you about my next kind of idea, or one of the ideas, and uh, again, we keep traction, we go and we go uh, after Pitch Fest, and then enter, I think it was, well, it's got to be what, last month maybe we started talking about something a little bit more serious when I had an animatic put together? Uh, it was December. Okay, December. I specifically December. remember I was out in a in a park shooting something sinister and your email came through and we started shooting in the park in December. Okay, so it was December and 
that's that's when we started talking. I said, Maria, look, I got this idea. I think you'd be perfect for it because I know you do a lot of indie stuff like I'm trying to do just for the sake of getting something done. You know, yeah. get, get past the system because the gatekeepers are a little much nowadays. They're afraid to take chances. And having done my previous film on Earthly, you know, it's a big kind of creature feature with budget effects. Um, yes. But you you do like the the kind of thriller horror stuff, even though you do other stuff. And I thought, you know what? This is kind of something for Maria. So I presented to you Grave Findings. Right. Um, what did you think about Grave Findings? Um, I showed you an animatic. For those of you out there that don't know about Grave Findings, you can check it out on pyroproductions.net and on various Facebook pages. It's essentially the tale about a guy who goes to the underworld to find the love of his life and bring her back. It's based on the Orpheus and Eurydice uh, Greek myth. But I presented the animatic to you, which is a contemporary take. And, and what do you remember about that? Um, I loved the concept. I love the fact that it was tied up to Greek mythology because um, that is actually very popular right now. And I think that popularity started with Percy Jackson, funnily enough. Um, I love the idea of people trying to rekindle something that uh, that is all too often taken as dead that idea of no i'm not going to accept that this is the last time i'm seeing someone i can do something about it i can save the situation that that bravery in in the face of almost overwhelming odds i i love that concept and i also from a business point of view i loved the fact i loved how the story was structured and that it opened the field to being able to get a lot of names in the fantasy slash horror um, slash science fiction genre, a lot of names involved in the project. So it's kind of the way the script is kind of written. You mentioned uh, opportunities for people from sci-fi and horror. It, the, there's this. It's like a road story. So it, like any good road story, the main character meets a lot of people on on their way, and there's just opportunity for people to pop in without huge commitment to the film and go from there. That's obviously a draw for you because you're already starting to connect the pieces together. But like any production, what do you think were the big challenges were? And, you know, I kind of know, but let's just talk about them so that everybody that's listening knows, you know, some of the flags that you see when, when scripts are presented to you. Um, in general, um, I will look for things like location, um, how many locations, how difficult it would be to film in a specific type of location, um, how many um, uh, cast members you will need, what uh, CGI slash effects are needed, um, all of those, what period the story is set in. Um, all of those things will serve to pad a budget where it doesn't necessarily need to be padded. Um, for instance, I'm reading a wonderful story that's set in like the 1950s. And I'm thinking, you know, this would actually live if it was set in present day. And we wouldn't have all the added expense of the period um, costumes and the period set pieces and props. Um, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so I think when indie writers are writing, um, they should think about things like that, that pet a budget, um, how many people are going to be in the film, um, where are the locations. I just read in a book the other day that if you add one scene in your script that's set at some place like Yankee Stadium, you're adding $100,000 onto your budget, just like that, just because you couldn't have the scene somewhere else. Yeah, I mean, um, let alone yeah. all the insurance costs, but the rental no, costs and yes. uh, you know the, the security costs. It's like all the ancillary below the line stuff that that is really hard to pinpoint. And you yeah. and you mentioned period stuff. It's not only what's written in the script, like the specialized props and you know picture vehicles and stuff. You know, it's everything else that the camera sees that you don't think of at first. Oh yeah. So maybe let, let's jump to that. I mean, because some of the challenges and, and great findings, the, the project that, you know, we're working on. And the best part I love about that is, you know, we're working on it. There's no rush to get it done. You, right. and, I, you and I have both identified some, some flaws in the script that still need to be ironed out. It's a healthy process. There's no point in rushing it. We're both busy as it is. Let's wait for it to be ready. Some of the stuff right. that we're up against is, like you said, uh, location, creatures, uh, effects type stuff. So it all kind of comes back to budget. But yes. But let's jump to that to that pitch fest scenario where we first met 2011 and again in 2012 where you get to meet lots of writers. What is that day like as you sit down essentially all day other than, you know, a bathroom break or lunch 
and and you see these these kids and these adults come in with their ideas to take us into into the mindset of being on the other side of the table. It's really nice when people bring you chocolate. chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> well, some of that is because you ask for desserts specifically. That um, was Angel. That yeah, was Angel. She so, was awesome. Yeah. So for those of you who don't know, this specific uh, Pitch Fest event, it's the Great American Pitch Fest. You get a booklet of who you're going to be meeting with. So you, you can do a little bit of research ahead of time. And everybody that's hearing pitches gets the opportunity to, to let you know what they want. And Maria and Angel went beyond what they wanted in terms of content. They wanted certain desserts. And of course, people will scramble to get noticed and be memorable. And kudos to them for doing that. And you're, you're mentioning chocolate. I think cheesecake was another one that was yes, mentioned. Yes, we, we actually got cheesecake, funnily enough. Yeah. So, <laughs> so what's it like other than the, 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 dessert being, <laughs> the dessert being nice? Because you're, you're locked in this, you know, this ballroom for eight hours. And right. the, 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 the cowbell bangs, the horn blows. And in comes like a crowd of people, you know, scrambling for their chairs. Yes. Um, as the day goes by, it gets more and more confusing to keep everyone separate in your mind. So it's very important to have hard copy material also to give to a producer, at least in my view, it is. Um, by the end of the day, I can look at names and have no remembrance of what these people look like but i can look at a storyline or a one sheet or some sort of publicity material and remember exactly what that script is like and if i'm interested in it or not um five minutes is a very small amount of time to cram a lot of information in and if business is brisk i can see 12 people per hour and i'm sitting there for eight hours that's a lot of people to get through it's almost like auditions but not quite. And I've sat behind the table with auditions too. So you liken it to like the audition process. And as a writer who's gone through this, uh, I think five years in a row now, it, it kind of feels like you're auditioning because, you know, you got to know your lines. You got to know the attitude, the pitch. You, 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 got, you know what works if you've done more, more than one pitch already. Um, and you said as the day goes on, it obviously gets tougher to sort it out. And that's where the hard copy materials come in and really, really help uh, keep things straight. Right. Um, you know, do you have any tips for writers that are that are approaching you? Like, you know, how to dress, you know, how to relax. Do you, do you care if they read off a page, if it's memorized, if they have notes? Um, um, well, what I would like to see is someone who is confident, but not cocky, not overconfident. Um, I wouldn't like to hear a memorized pitch. Um, I would like to think that people are confident in the quality of their project and as they've written it and lived with it for presumably years, they're able to talk about it off the cuff and tell me all the good points, all the good things about it without having to resort to a list of items that they've learned. Um, I'd like someone to connect with me on an individual basis. Um, not to be nervous. I'm not going to eat you. I'm not going to reject you. I'm not going to do anything horrible to you, actually. So just sit down, relax, um, and talk to me about this project of yours that you love so much that you want to see on the big screen. And yes, give me hard copy information and give me your contact details. Um, from the last batch of about uh, 50 to 60 people I saw last year there were a few people who didn't even give me their email addresses so I couldn't follow up with them I follow up with every single writer who contacts me at Pitch Fest okay? and I say please can I read the treatment to your project if I don't like that treatment I will say thank you but no um, if I do like it I will ask for a script but I will contact everyone who gives me their contact information it's some of them don't even contact me back I mean really you loved your script so much and then just ignore me when I say please can I read your treatment really yeah I mean that, that's kind of hard to believe I'm, I'm a firm believer in that some of the way that we get ahead in life is just by showing up you know, yeah, just yeah. by just by speaking up, answering the phone, or making the phone call, um, 
it, it blows my mind that people would forget to put their contact information on something that, you know, I mean, people pay money to go to this event. I think it's a couple hundred bucks just to pitch there all day. So right. not only is it money, but it's a lot of effort to go through that process. Right. And for people to just kind of forget to put that on there, maybe they're so nervous they forget to do it. I mean, that, you know, granted that maybe that happens. Yeah. But, but then for people not to follow up after you've taken the time to reach out to them, which is above and beyond normal i gotta tell you i mean right. I, i've had people request scripts at at pitch fest which is you know kind of the best thing that you can that you can hope for other than yes i'll buy it which really yeah. never happens yeah, yeah yeah i mean people request scripts i'll i'll follow up with them say okay here you go you know we met at pitch fest here here's the the script for you and i'll never hear back and you know what that that happens people get busy maybe they change their mind but yeah. for a producer to reach out and say Okay, uh, you know, we met at Pitch Fest. Send me a script, or you know, thanks for meeting at Pitch Fest. Um, what you were presenting wasn't quite what I'm looking for right now, but you know, keep in touch. For people not right. to respond to that is is crazy because to me, it's not about the script. I think the the next thing you always write will be better, or if you go back and write something else, the rewrite will only make it better. It's a it's an industry about relationships, you know. Exactly. Yes. Like if it's not this project, it's one down the road, and we. I don't know. We're not that far divided. There's only so many people in the industry. It is a kind of numbers game. So yes. it, just, it blows my mind that people are kind of ignorant to that fact. Um, but you know, I, like I've heard something like it, it's a weekend long thing. People usually get there Friday and they pitch Sunday. And I know like Friday night and Saturday, you know, specifically because Saturday during the day, there's a bunch of workshops where, right. where, you know, writers and, and, and writing teachers and mentors come in and tell people how to pitch, how to, you know, what to include in their story and that kind of stuff. So I know first and foremost that there are people, maybe like 10% that don't have the screenplay written in their pitching. Right, yes. And I know that other people are pitching like wild, wild ideas that would be impossible for them <laughs> to get greenlit. Like, you know, here's my, yeah. here's my trilogy. I'm going to tell you about story one and it's a sci-fi space opera and it's got to be all CG. Maria, will you make this film with me? And, you know, <laughs> Thank I, you, but no. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to shoot down the confidence because I don't know, you know, the, the connections that this writer has, but there's something that's a bit of a disconnect from the get go. Right. Like this is not quite, you know, what, what's capable, like take it into, into perspective. I mean, with, without feeling bad and I don't want you to maybe, you know, name any names obviously, but can you think of any strange horror stories of not little horror stories, but like you know, war stories of weird pitches that you've heard that people must have been out to lunch to maybe serve as a purpose for people not to make these mistakes? Well, there was one that was written on a napkin. Oh, well, um, that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, and I'm I, not going to be making that one. <laughs> and, I, and I take it that wasn't like connected thematically to the story about like uh, alcohol abuse or, or something <laughs> like that. It was just sheer unpreparedness. Sheer unpreparedness. Yes. Yeah. So somebody writes it on a napkin. What else? Like, what is the strangest story? I, I maybe that you've that you've heard pitched you. Maybe, and it doesn't have to be a pitch fest because I'm sure you're approached one way or another that, that you get with things. So I mean, I I don't know. Like like, does anything stick out that just seems like so off that people haven't done their research? Actually, no. You know, because I am open to all stories, and I. I like to look at all types of stories to see what someone can bring to it. Um, if I can find an emotional through line in a story, I will enjoy it. I it might that might not that that will not say that I will produce it because it might be not a genre that I'm wanting to work in or whatever right now. Um, but I think that all ideas and all stories have at least a percentage of merit. But as well, writers should look at what is possible and probable. As in, yeah, don't hand me a multi-million dollar budget movie if this is your first one. If you're trying to make a name for yourself, hand me something small and compact with a set number of actors and a set number of locations. And maybe you can get that one made. You know, because oh. people are not going to take a chance on the huge multi-million dollar movie if you're an unknown writer. Yeah. And I guess that's the other thing maybe that we should relate to people. And 
I don't want to be harping on people out there that are writing and, you know, tell them that they can't get their film made because, you know, people said the same thing about Unearthly having, you know, hundreds of effect shots. Oh, you'll never do it for what you're trying to shoot it for. And I did it so everybody can go yeah. go kiss the curb. But there, there's always a chance. I'm not going to take that away. But let's let's maybe just say that people don't realize how much a million dollars really is and yeah. that it's harder to get than you think. And because you see stuff like Transformers or a Spielberg film or something else that has budgets in the hundred millions, maybe, you know, you, you know, agree or disagree as you will. It's not common in more films, you know, probably a good million to one films as a ratio get made for a million dollars to five million dollars or less. Would you would you say? Wait, my mind is being boggled by the numbers. Say that again. So I would say that there's probably a million films that are made between the one million to five million dollar range for every hundred million dollar project out there. Yes, quite easily. Yeah. So when you're writing your script, take into account that you're probably, if you're even lucky to have a million dollars, that's what you that's what you gotta limit your 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 story and your scope on. Don't aim for the hundred million because. The odds of you getting a hundred million dollar film with like no track record, no name, no budget, or no star attached, is just insurmountable. Like again, yes. if if your uncle's the head of Paramount, you know all the power to you. Right. But but you mentioned some of the things that you look for in, in a story as a producer: emotional through line. I'm, yes. I'm going to try to go down for the point form stuff. So when people see you after listening to uh, our episode of the trenches here on the Wired In Network, they're going to know already you know, what you're looking for as far as research. You want an emotional through line. You want to be able to connect to the characters. Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I, my preferred genre is all types of horror, okay, and psychological thriller with horror overtones. Um, but I will totally read projects in other genres, but I have an affinity for horror because I think for one thing, I'm not afraid of it. I'm not afraid to portray or to show deep emotions and disturbing things that are happening and things like that. Um, it's my natural home. And I don't like formulaic horror. I don't like horror that does not make sense, stories that don't hold together. I like different horror, envelope-pushing horror stories, um, something that hasn't been tried before. Don't give me another slasher film, please, no. Um, but something that's a bit off, that's a bit different, that will make people think that is beautiful within the horror genre. I love beauty within horror. Um, things like, again, intense relationships, beautiful visuals. Amongst my favorite films is um, um, Dracula, the, the Gary Oldman Dracula, with all its stunning visuals. You know, um, that's the kind of stuff I like. So. That's the emotional through line something yeah. related to horror and like horrific beauty if i can coin mm. that phrase not to not to you know uh, manipulate your words yeah. um great visuals yes you, you also mentioned uh set number of casts and set number of locations yes it helps um at the level I am at at the moment, I do not delude myself into thinking I can get my little hands on millions of dollars, okay? Um, it's a ladder. We're all climbing it. Um, but I can possibly pull together something for a couple hundred thousand if I'm really, really pushed. Okay. You know, I'm climbing that ladder right now. Um, I am finding ways to get up that damn ladder because this is what I want to do with my life. Um, I also, by the way, had 20 years of experience in an accounting background. So I understand the contractual and the figure side of things as well as the creative. Well, and that's what I think really makes you attractive as a producer because you can help with the on-camera stuff and the off-camera stuff. You know, it's 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 a rare... It's a rare uh, not breed, not gift, but it's real. It's a rare skill set to be able to balance both, um, and that's why I would encourage people to try to seek people out like yourself, people that are multidisciplined. Because at the level that we're talking about, the micro budget level, right? You, you really need all the skill set that you can. I mean, oh, I'm, yeah. I'm sure the filmmakers that you're working with 
have shared discipline. So like you're dealing with writer directors, not like one writer and one director or, you know, director editors or directed cameraman, or maybe a combination of three things, which, right. which some people would, you know, caution against, but we don't really have the, the budget to kind of go above and beyond that. You know, you, you gotta, you gotta share a little bit of responsibility at this point. Sure, and it just depends. I don't think necessarily that combining jobs is a bad thing. Um, I just finished shooting uh, Something Sinister, which is a co-production between Monster Works 66 and Christopher Dye's company, Dynamic Film. Uh, Christopher wrote the script, and he is editing the footage as we speak. And I do believe he is the best editor to have on this project because he knows the story, and he knows exactly what he wants out of it so intimately that, you know, I think... He's, he's, he's literally the best guy to have for the job, and I'm stunned and thrilled with what he's going to bring to it. Yeah, you, you know, know, you know that, and that's a combination that, I, that I've been talking with people a lot lately. Uh, as you know, I edited the film that I directed and wrote. So right. I was involved in every step of the process, you know, screenwriting, right. production, and editing. And you rewrite the film each, each time. And oh, yeah. I, th I think it's I think it's a great combination, but I think it's a different kind of process that you've got to allow for because it wasn't it was only once I got the rough cut done that I realized that I wasn't happy with it. But the only way I would be happy with it is if I took some time away from it and literally took like oh, okay. I had to take six weeks off just to get perspective and realize, OK, I'm not the director and the writer. I, I got to quit making the script that's on the page and I got yeah. and I got to make the film that we shot. You know, right. just, you know, you write the film, you shoot the film, and then you, and then you edit the film. You're rewriting three times. Like I said, this time, you know, you're pushing images back to, back together rather than assembling them or writing them. Right. And for me, it just took that, that six week separation to say, okay, I'm divorcing myself from the ego that's on the page, from the ego on set. And just, you know, lean and mean. And from that point forward, I was able to take basically a two hour and 15 minute film and bring it well, down, bring it down to 92 minutes. Nice. So nice. it was just, you know, what's essential to the story, what works, wh you know, what, you know, just doesn't need to be there. No matter how cool the shot is, no matter <laughs> how, how memorable that shooting day was, what's essential. And answering that question, if, if you're an editor and you're in your soul, like directing or, or part of the writing process, then, then you got a home run. And I think that's what you're kind of talking about here with this, with this filmmaker. Right. Right. So that's one project that you just finished. Is there any other projects that you want to talk about briefly? I mean, uh, th this is going on, on air. We're in March at this point. Um, so I'm not sure if you have any campaigns that are that are live or uh, is, is there anything out there that you that you want to that you're proud of that you want to talk about or maybe go the opposite direction stuff that has come up in some of the indie productions that you've been on or bigger productions that, you know, you've had to get creative to work around some of the challenges. Um, okay, let's talk about reunion for a couple minutes. Sure. Um, the the idea that I had was like a couple of years ago that I had was like okay, um, I'm basically not really anyone in the Hollywood rankings right now, but I would really love to act, and I'm not going to be waiting around for the phone to ring because it might not ring. So I'm going to take this into my own hands. And I first of all envisioned Monster Works 66 as a sort of production liaison company. I would liaise between writers who are out of California and production companies that are in California. And I would bring those writer scripts to the attention of these production companies. Reunion was one of the very first films that was presented to me and not film scripts that was presented to me and I pitched it around to several companies until one, um, Sean Chow of SC Productions was like, I love this film, I want to see it made. In the meanwhile, I had attached myself to the project in the leading role. Um, I always like to attach myself to the projects I produce, and I don't care how big the role is. It can be one line, can be voiceover, can be the lead. It doesn't matter. I just like to be involved on a creative side as well. Um, to cut a long story short, we just wrapped a 14-day shoot on Reunion that saw 75% of the film get into the can. We have to find two more locations, and we'll be done with this film. It'll be into post-production. That is, that is a film. And forgive me if I sound conceited and arrogant, that would not have got made if it wasn't for me doing that initial pitching, that initial bridging of writer to production company. And this is actually my dream come alive. 
I didn't spend a lot of time thinking about that on set because it was just over all me completely and undermine what I was there to do, which was act. <laughs> um, but it's, it's astounding to me that anybody who puts their mind to doing something like this can actually get it done if they just try enough, you know? And that's also, I'm hoping, some sort of inspiration to anyone who might be listening to this. Don't just take things for granted. Do things. You can get things done. To me, that's like the definition of producer. I mean, a lot of people see, see the producer as, as a role who just gets money to, to make the project happen, but it's so much more than that. I mean, what you're doing, you know, taking people who don't have a footprint in L.A. or California at all, and you're, right. you're, you're breathing life into something that, you know, they, they believe in and that you're breathing life into and saying, you know, this film has to get made and, and you're making that transition for them. I'm I'm a ways away from there. I mean, I, I fully, you know, hug and envelop the, the the sentiment you just said. You know, anything is possible, and you know that's why I you know I kept pushing for my film despite the ridiculous number of effects. And you know, the <laughs> the, the Wired and Network podcast is you know another extension of that. We went from one show with multiple segments right. and an hour length to now we've got four or five shows a week. You know, and it's it's on a much smaller level because people are doing it for the joy of it and and love and it's hour and it's just audio and stuff, but. It's it's the same thing, you know. If you love it, you can make it happen. Just don't let, exactly. don't take no for an answer. Just keep looking. Just keep looking. Yeah. Um, it, reunion sounds like a great experience. It, you got two more locations, so maybe like another five days. It's a nineteen day shoot. It's a good healthy schedule. Right. Um, what what else is coming down the pipeline for you that you're looking forward to? Um, about a month back, I just finished the um first Indiegogo campaign for the uh, drama Love, Touch, Hate, which I'm co-producing with writer-director Michael LaPointe as well as um, Rachel Applebaum and um, Natalie Simpkins. Um, we're looking at shooting this in approximately June right now. Um, that is going to be such a beautiful film to do. Um, there is an emotional through line like you will not believe. And people are free to have a look at the Love, Touch, Hate page on Indiegogo. There's all sorts of information up there about the film, plus the clips from the different auditions for the different leading roles. Um, the campaign is not live anymore, but still, if you're interested in the film, have a look at it. It's going to be beautiful and so different. Um, I'm also anticipating a couple of other films that I helped produce to come out of post this year, including... Um, Live in Fear, that's Brandon Scullion's Live in Fear, Eric Michael Kochmer's Way Down in Chinatown, and Randall Cameron's Far Away, um, to name a few. And obviously Chris is something sinister as well. Um, I also just, just finished um, the first short film that MonsterWorks 66 produced solely, produced alone. So that was my first solo producing gig as well. And that was um, Graham Parker's Life is a Lottery with um, the amazing Craig Wallet as director. So I'm now looking for another short film to produce because I have a long-term project in mind, a DVD anthology of horror films in different genres. So I have a lot of things going on in my little tiny head. Um, and I'm just loving it because literally we can make our own rules. You know, we are, we are not shackled by anything right now. And indie filmmakers, more and more of them every day are realizing this. And the actors should also realize this. Well, you know, you, you mentioned that you're looking for another short project. I've already got my head spinning with ideas. So maybe uh, <laughs> off the air, I'll pitch you some ideas or send you some ideas just as a short basis because I haven't tackled anything short form for a while. And I think that could be fun. But I think you've proven beyond the shadow of a doubt. You know, I said, so what else is coming up next? And, you know, it was project, 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 project. It, it's, just, it's just incredible what you've got on the go and and what's coming through the pipeline and how quickly it's coming and what you're doing and what you're developing. And, you know, it, it hits all the check marks of the stuff that you're talking about. You can just tell by the titles, you know, live in fear, something sinister, yeah. uh, way down <laughs> Chinatown. There's, there's just, it, it's just evident. I mean, and it's, 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 it's crazy back to the stuff that quickly before we wrap up this, uh, this interview, you know, this is something I always ask producers and I'll give you my answer to it. Um, 
Is there like a, a film out there or, or like a mesh of two films that, that you would love to make? Like I was talking to one of my other uh, uh, friends today, screenwriting buddies, and I said, you know, I'd love to make something like The Shining, I, I like, you know, a good haunted house film again, but that's psychological based and not like, you know, like you said, not like a slasher film, not like a crazy ghost story, but something psychological in the vein of The Shining. Is there anything out there for you that you would love to... To, to, to get your hands on, like the ultimate kind of request, I guess. Uh, yeah. I would like to make something along the lines of a David Lynch film where you're not quite sure what is real and what is not real. And it's open to interpretation. And it has wonderful imagery that leaves people going, oh my God, what was that? And I have a script that's very, very much like that. And I'm at the very beginning phases of doing things with it right now, trying to get potential director, trying to get a potential leading role, um, leading man attached to it, all sorts of things like that. That to me is out there. It's risky. It's going to be a cult classic. That I mean, I, I if if people approach you and have listened to this podcast and they don't know what you want, you can slap them upside the head or something because I, I've never heard a producer be so eloquent with exactly what they're looking for. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think given everything else that you've mentioned, you know, uh, a horror film, you know, limited locations, cast numbers, something that's yeah. beautiful, visual, in the vein of David Lynch, like... You can't get more specific than that, and and it's exciting as from a writer's point of view. It's like, okay, well, what does that mean? And you know, uh, you know, is 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 this idea kind of like that? And the wheels are turning in my head already. I'm excited. Uh, you know, would you ever consider you know shooting something like that or any of your other projects in South Africa again, or are you like uh, U.S. like landlocked? Oh no, I'd love to shoot in South Africa. In fact, I just um, connected with two South African filmmakers from Cape Town about three weeks back and we are just taking baby steps with looking to see what we might be able to do together. Um, I'm, I speak, the, the short film I produced was um, a writer from the UK. I'm speaking to writers in France, in Australia, um, literally all over the world, in South Africa. Um, I don't see myself limited to the USA. I think anything is possible and you just have to put your head down and find ways to do what you want to do. Well, I'm telling you right now, if you go back to South Africa, it's either going to be uh, on a short that I write direct or I'm going to come along as an editor and we're going to knock it out of the park because I'd, I've always wanted to go to South Africa. I don't know a lot about it, but I'm just ready to get overblown by the culture or, you know, I'll... Throw, throw my name in the hat for all those other international territories. I'm sure that would be a wild adventure as well. Oh, that would be awesome. Yes. Okay, so to ra wrap things up for you, Maria, because I've kept you yeah. away from all your duties long enough, we always end the interviews with uh, kind of a let's play a game mini segment. It's a giant what-if scenario. Yes. Um, uh, it's, it's, three, it's three fun questions. The first one is, what director present day would you love to work with the most? Uh, why and what capacity would you like to work with them? I would like to work with Tim Burton because he always does fascinating and new and interesting things. And I would like to work um, as an actor and I would love to, oh my goodness me, I would love to work opposite Helena Bonham Carter. That's, uh, I, I think there's a few people that would be in the same boat, but with you in that respect. The, the second question I have for you, you can work on any film, past, present or future, what film and what role do you want, and, and I guess why? Gone with the Wind, Scarlett O'Hara. Um, she's such a fascinating and wonderful character. It would just be such an interesting emotional ride. Okay, and the third question I have for you, really fun, you know, <laughs> definitely not in the realm of possibility, but, <laughs> well, maybe, I'm not going to throw it out of the park. If you could be any superhero... Who would it be, why, and how would you use that, those heroes' abilities to help your, your film goals? Um, you know, my first choice was Wonder Woman because I grew up reading Wonder Woman comics. But then I'm like, no, Supergirl, because she's got the invulnerability. I'm a DC girl through and through, by the way. Um, <laughs> and how would I use that to help making movies? Um, hey, that'll be easy. No transportation costs to other locations. I could just fly everyone there. 
I like it. You're you're always thinking as a producer. Let, let's <laughs> let's find a way to make the production budget uh, lower than it needs to be. Uh, transportation, let alone you know, if there's a car or something in the shot, you can move move it with your super strength, or exactly. you, yes. you, you can you know <laughs> use laser vision and all that kind of stuff. Maria, it's it's been a real pleasure. I'm glad you were able to take the time to be on the of trenches. Um, it's the Wired In Network. Everybody listening, again, this is this has been Maria Olson. Check her out. We're going to post links on, on our page. Maria, thanks again. This is the Wired In Network coming at you every week. Uh, the Trenches on Sundays, our ongoing series of interviews with filmmakers. Thanks again for listening in, and we will see you next week. Hey.